Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judge David Wedby from the King County Superior Court. Um, I'm glad to welcome you to our presentation on ableism in the courts, discussing ways to make uh, our courts accessible to persons with a range of disability. Um, this program is sponsored by the Courts and Community Committee that we have here at King County Superior Court as part of, as, as part of our um, October Disability Awareness Month. Um, I am very pleased and excited to uh, introduce David Carlson, who is going to be giving the presentation this afternoon. Um, David uh, comes to us from Disability Rights Washington, where he leads the advocacy um, program there by co coordinating the work of its advocacy, uh, various advocacy programs that they have. Um, these programs monitor facilities and community settings, investigate potential abuse and neglect, issue public reports and videos, engage in both traditional and social media advocacy, and they conduct systematic legal and policy advocacy um, and provide Washingtonians with disabilities with information about their legal rights and support in being better self-advocates. Um, David has served as lead counsel in numerous class actions and other systematic advocacy efforts enforcing a wide variety of civil rights of people with disabilities. Um, he's also, his work has uh, been recognized in the international media and by several local and national awards. Um, he uh, presents on disability legal issues, legal ethics, and advocacy skills around the country and has taught disability law as an adjunct professor at the Seattle University. So we're very um, excited to hear from David. I am just going to add that David is a disabled lawyer, um, which I mentioned with his permission. Um, he has a congenital heart defect and learning disabilities. And the reason I added this um, information about him is just to illustrate um, one of the purposes of this afternoon's presentation that people with disabilities, users of our courts with disabilities, um, often will have disabilities that are not necessarily apparent. And so part of uh, David's presentation is to help us all um, be mindful and aware of people with disabilities, even if it might be subtle, and to figure out the best ways to make our courts accessible for everyone who may have a disability. Um, before we go any further, just a few practical notes. Um, make sure that you turn off, you mute yourselves and, and, and darken your screen during the presentation. Um, David intends, or his, his plan is to leave uh, about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. We figured out, we figured the best way to do that today is really to have you um, write up any questions you have and enter those into the chat box. Um, I will try to keep track of that in, in addition to Beth Taylor who's um, and, and Rhonda Bly, who's uh, worked with us at the King County Superior Court um, on disability issues. And so we will um, try to keep track of those and ask as many as we can at the close of the program. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to David. David, thanks again. Uh, take it away. Uh, the show is yours. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me. Um, and I, I love the amount of interest we have for this. And um, I'll just jump right in. So hopefully I can have time to answer folks' questions when we when we get done. Um, I, I will say at the outset, though, I... Uh, um, uh, I can sometimes be a bit provocative uh, in order to elicit questions. So as Judge Woodby pointed out, just throw them in the chat and we'll get back to them. Don't worry, we're not going to lose track of them. So I'm going to share my screen here because of PowerPoint. Um, not because I think PowerPoints are great, but people feel you're prepared when you have one um, and you know what you're talking about. So we're going to talk about ableism in the courts. And let's see, here we go. I'll give you a quick overview of where we're going to go. There will be a brief introduction. We'll talk about what is disability, what are ableism and sanism, and what can be done about ableism and sanism. So as the introduction, as was mentioned, I'm with Disability Rights Washington, and every state and territory has one of us. The federal government um, created an independent uh, protection and advocacy system in every state and territory uh, that is responsible for advancing the civil and human rights of people with disabilities. 
We have special powers to go anywhere there is a person with a disability. And as you'll learn today, people with disabilities are everywhere. So we go everywhere. We can just walk in unaccompanied to King County Correctional Facility and say, we want to go to the seventh floor and just wander around and talk to people at self rent. And if they want to talk privately, we'll get us room. Uh, go to state psychiatric hospitals, homeless shelters, wherever there is a person with a disability, including their own homes, we can go there. We don't kick down people's doors. We ask them if they want to come in. But we go to people's own homes as well. Um, so uh, I'm a weaver. M most most lawyers that know me only learned that once we started doing things in the pandemic and I was working from home. At first I was in my weaving studio. Now I'm just in a spare bedroom. But uh, an advocacy gamp is kind of what I try to think of our advocacy that we do is if you'll see here, and I think you can all see my cursor. If not, I'll describe what I'm doing. But there are columns going up and down and rows going across. Across the row is one color of yarn and going down the columns is another color of yarn. And when you get to a square where it is yellow on yellow, it's a very yellow color. It's kind of boring. It's a flat yellow color. Um, if you move to in either direction, you start to get more interesting connections um, and intersections being made. And you can see with what is this, one, two, three, four, five, uh, seven colors, um, you actually have many more than just seven colors available to you if you combine them in different ways. So we combine all of these different advocacy modalities, as we call them, uh, to do the type of advocacy we need to do. Uh, and today I'm doing educating some policymakers because you all set policies and practices for your courts, um, I also lobby, I investigate things, I monitor. As I said, I can go anywhere there are people with disabilities. We also can have confidential informants. So I have lots of folks spilling the beans about what's going on bad at different places. And then I can use that to create videos. Maybe we've done that at King County Correctional is brought video cameras inside the jail to talk about the, um, uh, the lack of following the law when it comes to forced medications and how the hearings happen there. And um, uh, so we can do that or we can file a class action lawsuit. And so some of you may have heard of Disability Rights Washington because of our involvement with True Blood, for example, that hits a lot of superior court judges uh, attention once in a while. Uh, so that's the introduction of who I am, where I'm coming from, just to let you know. But I said, we, we, we address civil and human rights of people with disabilities across state, what's a disability. That's also gonna be relevant to you in thinking about how do we make our courts more welcoming and inclusive of people with disabilities. So I'm gonna start. Uh, Judge Whitby let you know, I've got a disability. So don't answer because you now have met me that I, this is this, but go through these questions. The poll is your relationship with disability. You don't have to answer them individually, but either a show of hands or in the uh, um, the, the chat, I'll try and make this a little interactive. Um, do you have one or more, a disability yourself, an immediate family member with a disability, an extended family member with a disability, a friend or coworker with a disability? Um, there are many ways that we relate to people with disabilities, either as one or, and even if you do have one, you may also have a family member or your coworker. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, and, and I love seeing all the hands, um, now maybe in the chat, folks can put out there, what are some of the disabilities you thought of when answering that poll? And what are some other disabilities you can think of, maybe that weren't directly related to your experiences? But um, so I'm going to pull up the chat. Um, one of my uh, uh, strengths is talking, not reading. So, um, but I'll try and pull a couple out here. Mobility issues, multiple sclerosis, autism. Uh, I think I saw uh, both my children have hidden disabilities, extended family members with disabilities, breathing issues. Great. We're getting learning disabilities, deafness. We're getting lots of examples, cerebral palsy. You're going to have people in your court every day with some of these as well, right? This is, these are not um, sort of rare genetic conditions that one out of 100,000 people have and you, you've never seen it before. Um, and that's, so we're gonna talk about, this doesn't have to be 
we're not reinventing the wheel all the time. Um, so I'd like to point out an old study. This is now 10 years old, uh, but there hasn't been another one yet that's looked at this. I think there's one in the works, but the Washington Lawyers Survey, and when they asked questions about disability, they said 21% of respondents listed having at least one disability. One thing I think is interesting about this is I think it's a drastic undercount, um, especially when thinking about the things you all listed, uh, but also because um, only 1.3% of respondents indicated they had a mental illness. Um, I have a, a working theory about why that is. At the time the survey was done, the Washington State Bar Association had a character and fitness question when you applied, do you have a mental illness? And if you answer yes, you had to sign a release to have your, um, your therapy notes handed over to the Bar Association so they could assess whether or not you had the character and fitness to be a lawyer. Um, that has since changed because of some advocacy from the bar members themselves. Our office worked a lot with with folks to, to explain why this is problematic but and reinforce stigma and is probably the reason why only 1.3 people, even in an anonymous, 1.3% 1, 1 of the people responding in an anonymous survey said, I've got a mental illness. Because we know that at least 20% of the population has a mental illness that's being treated at any given time. Um, and so, and, and even those are old statistics from back when um, we we're doing a lot of the work around getting the, the rule changed. I would say stigma has not been eliminated, but has been reduced uh, over time. And there are probably more people willing to seek treatment that were not in the past. So, um, but one thing that's really important, if you look at the second bullet, is that not only were 21% of lawyers who responded to the survey say they have at least one disability, but when compared to other uh, protected classes that were examined uh, or identities that maybe don't have any legal protection, but were identities that were important to people and impacted their the way they approached their work. The people with disabilities were the second highest frequency of experiencing barriers. 18% enco encountered barriers always or often. Now, not all of them are litigators who are showing up in superior court. Some are going to be transactional lawyers. Some are going to work for corporations as in-house counsel, but 18% encountering barriers always or often probably also indicates we attorneys are with disabilities are seeing barriers in court processes pretty frequently as well. And when compared with other protected classes, the people with disabilities experience the highest in the measurement of severity of impact. So you could say, eh, it impacts me a little bit or once in a while, or it impacts a lot. And um, they, they uh, indicated that, uh, they, that when it does impact them, it impacts them in a significant way. Um, so I want to offer that disability is a broad concept. It's not, um, it's not describing anything that is objective and true in reality. It is just reflecting people who are on this side or that side of a line that has been drawn. Um, and in that respect, it's, it's, it's a construct. It's, it is broad. Um, and we are going to today, as we move to the next section, uh, talk about disability. That's what I think of this first uh, upper left-hand picture is a picture of the universal accessible symbol. Um, represented by someone who uses a wheelchair or a stick figure uh, who uses a wheelchair. And then uh, just directly to the right of that is a, uh, uh, is a picture that of, of, of a brain supposed to be depicting uh, sort of thinking and uh, uh, thinking about disability, uh, thinking in a way that maybe is not how the majority thinks, but is nonetheless a valid way of existing in the world. And then similarly, communicating, communicating about disability. That's what we're going to talk about is how do we communicate? How do we let people know that this is a safe place to say you have a disability because we're actually going to care when you tell us that and we're going to do something about it. Um, 
And we might do that, we might communicate in different ways in order to accomplish that. And then how do we go out into the world, um, picture of someone walking with a white cane, uh, navigating the world. And I hope by the time we get to the end, that, that that's why you all showed up, is let's get some practical ideas here going. Um, I won't be able to exhaustively tell you practical ideas for every single disability, but I hope to, to highlight some resources that as you uh, come across people who identify different needs in your systems that you're working in, you can go to these resources and try to help the individuals come up with some good fixes or uh, mitigations to whatever barriers might be in place on a typical day. Now, I said um, where disability is a uh, construct, uh, and it depends on what side of the line you are. This is a political cartoon I'll describe uh, for folks that is, and let me just check the chat really quick. Okay, um, yes. Um, this is a political cartoon from 1926, won the Pulitzer Prize for political cartoons that year. Um, I do not know who won in 2000, or in 1925 or 1927, but in 1926, uh, it was Daniel Fitzpatrick, um, and it's titled The Laws of Moses and the Laws of Today, lamenting uh, how we've really complicated things with all these laws. And as judges, you deal with these things. you got to get up to speed on this or that. There's some certain things you probably deal with all the time, and you're sort of in your pocket when you're there with those laws, but someone introduces a new statutory scheme. You know, oh, okay, brief me on this, uh, lawyers. And that's what I'd like to offer is even when we talk about disability, I think people have in their mind some statutory scheme, maybe if we start talking about disabilities and laws, or they, as we earlier, we just personal relationships we have with people or disabilities we have ourselves. But know that there are dozens of laws that touch on the lives of people with disabilities, and each of them have different definitions of disabilities because, you know what legislative body can't resist the urge to just tweak it a little bit. So um, the first assignment I ever give when I do teach law school classes is um, go find a definition of disability. And then the next class, we just go through and talk about how they're similar or different. But, and so people pull out of a hat. I just cut up a bunch of statutory schemes, I go find them. So workers' compensation, social security, disability income, vocational rehabilitation act, the ind individual Medicaid programs, both the federal definitions as well as the state definitions, the developmental disabilities assistance and bill of rights act, the protection and advocacy of individuals with mental illness act, the rehabilitation act, the Americans with disabilities amendments act, the fair housing act, the Washington law against discrimination, state and local laws, that doesn't even count statutory uh, uh, tax schemes that, that provide tax benefits for certain uh, disabilities and not others. There are just a variety of legal definitions of what is a disability and what is not. Um, today though, I know you're interested in how to make your courts accessible and we'll talk about the statutory schemes that are applicable there. Um, and but before we get there, I'd like to talk about ableism and sanism, because all of these statutory schemes are created by policymakers who want to remedy some, some aspect of our society. They want to improve or mitigate some harm, but one way or another, ableism or sanism is what's driving that. So let's, let's start. What do, here's a visual that we created a long time ago. Uh, back when people were honestly like, yeah, this is like 15 years ago. So it was kind of novel. Google's filling in my search for me. And when you type in mental illness and what is it crowdsourcing from the internet? And it thinks you might want to finish that sentence with violence, crime, homelessness, gun control, not Abraham Lincoln, not um, access to treatment or art or depiction in film. No, it's all bad stuff. So um, ask yourself, you don't need to put this in the chat, but if you want to, that's that's cool too. Um, when someone says disability, what are some of the things you'd finish that sentence? Disability and 
mental illness and, Down syndrome and, deaf and? How do we finish those sentences? Do we finish them in very legalistic ways? Do we finish them in pejorative ways or positive ways or pitying ways or medical ways? There are many ways to finish that sentence. Um, and many algorithms that might drive us one direction or another, whether it's by Google or what the media is pushing us, uh, social media or old school media, what is de being depicted out there. And that is what we're getting at when we start to get at ableism and sanism is there are some explicit things. There are the mental illness and violence, mental illness and crime associating uh, disability with bad things. Then there are also those algorithmic things, the structural things that we don't even really see that drive us in different ways. And we don't really see that we are using to drive ourselves in different ways. And so uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Here's another. Uh, this is also an old slide that I've used forever. And it used to just have um, these, uh, these old film camera filters on the side. And then I was teaching a high school class last year and realized none of them knew what these things were and said, I need to update this. We, we still have filters for pictures. Um, and does it mean that the picture is completely wrong? No. Does it mean that it's completely right? No. Does it, is it better? Is it worse? I, it's changed. It is something different. It is still grounded in reality in some fashion, but it's been filtered in some way. And that's the implicit bias is a filter that turns fact into fiction. So we should be examining where our concepts of disability come from. And um, there are sort of four ways that in the disability community, we often talk about the types of filters that are used. And you can start to identify them in uh, conversations on cable news, or you can identify them in presentation in some TV show, or how it, how disability shows up in debate in Olympia about what what should we do with the Involuntary Treatment Act next year, and you can see how different models or different um, filters of disability are are playing out. I'll offer the four to you, and then run through the examples of the four. Uh, so there's the moral or religious, medical, legal, and social. Now, a lot of times people are like religious, like, oh, in some like religious scripture, there's, they equate uh, mental illness with uh, possession or uh, as some punishment for doing some bad thing or some family or doing some bad thing. Yeah, sure. That's, that is an example of that. But I think more relevant to sort of secular society and what you might hear in a courtroom is around, yeah, but this person was doing the drunk driving and got hurt versus was hurt by a drunk driver. And what type of um, supports should be made available to that individual? Now, if you're the state legislature and you're designing your Medicaid program and you're saying everyone who makes below a certain amount of money should have access to a certain level of health care and um, where where do we need to impute that that morality? Nowhere. Now you might when you're talking about who's responsible for one thing or another. So it's not that morality is never an appropriate thing, but to saddle disability with that and to make disability policy decisions based on, I don't know if I want to give a traumatic brain injury patient the same thing that someone with an intellectual or developmental disability from birth got because that the second the first person was doing risky behavior that led to the brain injury. The other person was just born that way. Those are moral distinctions that drive uh, disability thoughts, and uh, uh, we'll see that uh, we develop an entire infrastructure around deciding who deserves and who doesn't deserve to get access to um, disability-related supports, for example, or disability-related protections. The medical uh, model of disability uh, does what the medical model does. The medical model is designed at identifying and eradicating. That's what you find cancer, identify, eradicate. That does little to address all of the other ways cancer impacts someone uh, and cancer is a disability. It is. Uh, 
a uh, your body is doing things that uh, uh, are are different and in different are impairing your ability to do other things. Um, legal is similar to medical in that it categorizes and says, oh, you're in, you get a protection or you get a benefit. You're out, you don't get a, a protection or a benefit. The social model says, this is not about categorizing people. This is not about moralizing people. This is about looking at the society in which we live and saying, we made decisions about where to put cars and where to put people and where to put buildings in our town. And we made decisions not to put curb cuts in, for example. Um, that means that people who need a curb cut can't get or can't receive the same benefit that other people who don't need that curb cut could get to that sidewalk that we put there or to that road that we put there. Um, we decided you know, it's really cool if uh, buildings can look like old Greek buildings with columns and some big steps up to them and uh, didn't think, oh, wait, we're going to have to retrofit all these things to put uh, wheelchair ramps in. And um, or we have large cafeterias with lots of hard surfaces and lots of booming sounds and someone with hearing loss just can't hear the person sitting right next to them. We designed those spaces. We, we didn't have to design them that way. We designed spaces that say if a politician like... Um, the, the the Fetterman in Oz back in Pennsylvania. If a if if a politician does what I just did there, I wasn't doing that for effect, but like stumbles across like what are they trying to say? Um, ah, I don't know. That's gonna be it's gonna be rough. It's like really, is that how policies are written in the in the United States uh, Senate? Is you know if you don't spit it out in thirty seconds, well, like you missed your opportunity. It's like no, these things grind out over years and months, and you got staff doing most of this stuff. And what we're what we're really buying when we send you there is your worldview, not how pithy you are. Um, and so uh, those are all the social constructs we've built around who's in, who's out on disability. And we can move those around, uh, just like we can move around the legal definitions or the medical diagnosis categories to include more or less. But the main difference here is that in the social model, it moves the disability as being an immutable internal trait of the individual to being something that's just a function of how society decided to set up some rules and uh, physical structures. So uh, then what are ableism and sanism within that? Uh, they are simply stigma and bias against people with disabilities is ubiquitous in our culture. Ableism is a word that describes negative stereotype beliefs about people with disabilities generally. And even if you didn't know that, you kind of deduce that. Like, yeah, I know other isms, and that's what that is. It's the ism around ability. So this is the ism around sanity. Sanism is, the, is a more specific term uh, addressing negative stereotype beliefs about people with mental illness. This is the one people are probably less familiar with. Um, and uh, honestly, like when I started, this is, I learned this term before I learned ableism because we weren't really using ableism. We we're just calling it like disability discrimination or something. But what that evokes in people's minds is some bad guy in a room, like scheming of how am I going to fire this person with a disability I hate. And that happens. I've had clients that literally there's a bad guy who walks the the uh the staff in in the office during lunch because they don't want disabled people interacting with the customers um but that's i think ableism is a better word in that it 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 allows the mind more easily to switch between individual explicit and um more systemic implicit uh biases and uh, so, but we'll jump into sanism because I think that that's probably something people spent a little less time thinking explicitly about. Um, so, sanely is sanism is largely invisible because it is so socially accepted. How many times have you heard someone use a word to describe someone as, with a mental illness in a pejorative way, but then also use it to apply it to just bad actors or bad ideas or outrageous situations. Um, that happens 
pretty regularly and nobody really blinks an eye. I don't say nobody, very few people blink an eye. I think more and more as we are trying to think about the ways we express ourselves and how they impact other people in a more deliberate way, um, and that's becoming more acceptable and not marginalized as merely politically correct, but rather a practice that helps people be their whole selves without shame in, in a situation. Perhaps uh, you are seeing it or you've been examining it more yourself too. Um, I, I speak from some of this as just as an old white guy who uh, in the past very little was expected of. Uh, so I think we are doing better at expecting better, but that still doesn't mean at large socially, it's generally accepted to be sanest. Um, sanism is based predominantly upon stereotypes, myths, superstitions, and lack of um, individualization of people with mental disabilities. Ordinary common sense is, I'm going to have a slide after this that describes that. It's a phrase, obviously ordinary common sense isn't that unique a term, but in this context is a phrase that um, Professor Emeritus from New York Law School, Michael Perlin, uh, uses to describe that implicit bias and how it shows up in um, uh, in, in sanest action, specifically of courts. Um, he's written a lot about uh, sanism in courts. Uh, it infects our court system with officers of the court making decisions based on discriminatory myths and assumptions, not evidence. Um, so I'll elaborate on that. Perlin, on ordinary common sense, the entire legal system makes assumptions about persons with mental disabilities, who they are, how they got that way, what makes them different, what there is about them that lets us treat them differently, and whether their conditions are immutable. These assumptions reflect our fears and apprehensions about mental disability, persons with mental disability, and, poss and the possibility that we may become mentally disabled. Um, he goes on to list in a different article called On Sanism, which I think is a great primer on sanism. Uh, and, and it came out 30 years ago. I was like, oh my word, this is, this is old. But honestly, everything's still there. Um, there are, he offers uh, just some 10 myths. These aren't the only, this isn't an exhaustive list. Um, but that mentally ill individuals are different and perhaps less human. They are erratic, deviant, morally weak, sexually uncontrollable, emotionally unstable, superstitious, lazy, ignorant, and demonstrate a primitive morality. You can see uh, all sorts of uh, popular culture depictions of that, but you can also see a lot of the same thought when you go to Olympia and you talk to uh, folks about what we should do to address mental illness from a public health or a public safety perspective. Um, you can see in the, that's just part of his description, that first one. But then the second one, that most mentally ill individuals are dangerous and frightening. That they're invariably more dangerous than non-mentally ill persons. Uh, um, and such dangerousness is easily and accurately identified by experts. That I, there was a, um, there was a great presentation by um, uh, a, a, a a Washington State Supreme Court justice uh, several years ago, maybe 15 or more years ago now, at the Center for Forensic Services down at uh, Western State Hospital. Um, and I, I don't remember why I was sitting in on it, um, but I was there um, and it was for the doctors. And he's like, you know what? In all of my career, I keep getting all these expert opinions from all of you. A lot of them are cut and pasted, and a lot of them are written with great certainty when everything I read uh, says there's no way you can be that certain. So what, what's up? You know, and, and that is, I, I, I thought, uh, one of the only times I've seen, I mean, I'm, I'm not in your courtrooms on a daily basis, so this isn't a critique of you, but I'm talking about from a systemic uh, position where I saw the legal system push back on the experts and say, really? You, 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 you're really confident that this person, you know, or when you're wishy-washy here, how wishy-washy is that? Are, you, are we talking like 20% confident, 50, you know, like doctors don't really deal with our preponderances that, that, that we do. Um, the three, that um, people with mental illness are presumptively incompetent. Maybe you don't legally say that, but there's a real shift of, well, you know, there's that. So, 
I'm going to lean in that direction. Or if they're incompetent in this setting for this decision making, I have got to um, uh, not allow them to make other decisions in other settings. And you know, the, the you'll see the the ways that the legislature struggles with that around guardianship law of how do we do this, and then how does that get translated in real life? Because they may write one thing in the guardianship law or in the uh, involuntary uh, treatment act and it may be applied entirely differently in OMAC than it is in King County. So how do we get inter-rater reliability there? It's removing a lot of the uh, biases or uh, implicit bias if it's not explicit around incompetence and how how much are you willing to fill in the gaps between what evidence you have in front of you and the um, uh, the decision you have to make. So med refusal is bad. Uh, lay people can detect, quote, crazy. Um, pejoratives are okay. Using the word crazy is okay. It's okay to use in other contexts to describe other things. Uh, segregation is okay. And by segregation, I mean that it's totally cool that we've got Western State Hospital because then there's a place for people as opposed to, but they need a service, right? Why do we need a segregated place for that service? Why do we need to destroy someone's life by taking them out of their family, their work, their friends, their daily lives, and put them away for a long period? Isn't that, that putting away? That's typically a punishment. And we say, oh, we'll dress it up and we'll say we're giving them treatment to make it constitutional. And like, yeah, a lot of times we don't provide the treatment, but even if we did, couldn't we provide that treatment in someone's home? And you totally could. And there's civil rights uh, actions you could bring around that. And those are more structural things than anything you have your hands in the ability to do. But that notion that segregation is okay, and maybe even for their own good, um, when we know that segregation is a negative thing that is applied either as a punishment or as a means of explicit or implicit segregation, if it's, say, racial segregation in schools, as an example. So uh, that mentally ill people are the most dangerous types of offenders, that so there's some sort of erratic thing that we can't predict, and that's, that makes uh, the individual very dangerous, more dangerous than someone who's intending to be dangerous, um, that they don't try hard enough. If they just tried, this they we wouldn't be here and so we're going to moralize the the illness that they have in a way we wouldn't with a gunshot victim or if i have a heart attack right now you'd all be worried about me if i uh were doing some other things you might be more annoyed than worried with me and therefore try to moralize or criminalize what i'm doing and then if we uh if not for i love this one because i'm one of these good dude doers. It, it, uh, I'm not a public defender, but I do this more on a systemic level. If not for the good doer attorneys, they would be where they belong in institutions. And I, 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 I don't expect you to do anything with that, but walk around with that thought for a little bit and see how often that pops up. Because as someone who does it, it pops up a lot in um, public policy debates, in public, uh, in um, uh, media at large. Um, because again, um, one of the, the sanest myths is that segregation is okay and that people are dangerous, so they need to be in these settings anyways. Now, what can we do about this? If, if we know that, wow, there's a lot there, and probably then for other disabilities, there's all sorts of built-in implicit biases we have, sometimes explicit, like when we don't even care if we have them, we're just going to leave it to hang out there and let people know. Uh, well, let's say we want to do something about it. What do we do? And and how might that show up in courts? Now, we have, um, okay, I've got about another 10 minutes before I, um, and I'm at a good spot here for that, before I lean into questions. So I just want to give you a 10 minute warning. Think of some questions. Don't be so captivated by my my oration that you get lulled into sense of thinking you're not going to participate. Uh, so we've got many different legal schemes. I want to just offer that all of them are defective in, uh, to, to some extent because policymakers decided to hitch the medical model and the legal model together in an ableist way. Because after the Civil War, they, the federal government created their first disability law to give pensions to Civil War vets who had disabilities. And they there were 860,000 uh, serving Union soldiers with disabilities and they wanted, well, we don't want people faking it though. So that's sort of the original sin of 
of disability law is it was created to avoid people faking it. Not like, oh, you did a great job. Just come on in and get your pension. And if you need it, you need it. If you don't, you don't. And so to this day, we've got elaborate systems put in place to decide, do you deserve a catheter? Do you deserve a colostomy bag? I don't know anyone who doesn't need a catheter or colostomy bag who's looking for one, but um, that is, uh, so we spend a lot of money to decide who should be in and who should be out. And that's from the very beginning. Um, and we decided who should get it, more physical disabilities, not mental disabilities. Um, and it was under this idea of wanting to be efficient and not wasteful. Um, so the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed in 1990, now a lot after the Civil War, but we've had, we, we had many other disability related things pepper throughout our legal history until then. Um, and in doing so, the Congress made a finding that individuals with disabilities are a discrete and insular minority that have been faced with restrictions and limitations subject to a history of purposeful, unequal treatment. Purposeful, unequal treatment. And relegated to a position of political powerlessness in our society based on characteristics that are beyond the control of such individuals and resulting from stereotypes, assumptions, not truly indicative of the individual ability of such individuals to participate and contribute to society. Um, that, that sounds good to me. Uh, that also is on the heels. 1990 is four years after the U.S. Supreme Court said people with disabilities aren't an insular minority. They get rational basis scrutiny under constitutional uh, protections. So um, there is a back and forth over time. Uh, we do this and then we do that and we're punching this way and that way. Um, and the ADA said, no, Supreme Court, we are going to reject your analysis and create our own civil rights statutory scheme to fill the vacuum you created by only providing rational basis. I offer that as um, just a, a sort of from someone who does multimodal advocacy and thinking through where do we go when the federal courts start to take away some rights? Well, we might go in a different direction. The federal courts uh, took away constitutional protections or at least uh, did not provide them to people with disabilities in the mid 80s. So the federal legislative branch decided to create some statutory schemes around that. Um, and we've had other rights eroded this last uh, uh, Supreme Court session and there could be other changes in the laws coming down the pike. and those those um, individuals who are affected by the discriminatory actions aren't going anywhere. They will continue to, to look for um, ways to, to move forward with uh, protections around disability. And I offer that because many people are seeing state courts as perhaps this is where we will start to litigate more things that have historically gone to federal courts. And in order to do that, courts have to be accessible to litigants with disabilities, lawyers with disabilities. Um, the Americans with Disabilities Act is what predominantly will govern your analysis of is there a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or major life activities. Uh, a person either currently has those three, has a history of a disability, or is regarded as having a disability. Um, and then where does the, where is, where is ableism addressed by the ADA? you're going to be looking at state and local government services. That's what you are. Um, you're not a private business open to the public and you are employers though. So in that, when you have that hat on, you are acting there as well. Um, I'm going to skip this and get to Lane versus Tennessee. That's a US Supreme Court case that lays out some reasons why the ADA is important in courts because the ADA is remedying constitutional violations in courts. It, uh, addresses the right to be present at all stages of a criminal case, uh, have a jury of your peers, for a civil litigants to have an opportunity to be heard, and for members of the public to access criminal proceedings. Um, so if, if you don't provide accessible environments, you very quickly get to, oh, but then was someone not able to be present for all stages? Were they, did they not have a jury of their peers? You start to very quickly get to some pretty serious um, deficiencies in your court processes. So what do we actually do? This is the part I think you want and part I hope sparks the questions for our last 15 minutes here. 
Uh, first, foremost, listen to the person with disability. They know their disability better than anyone else. With that, I will provide a caveat. And maybe not a caveat. It's a, some advice on how to do that is they know their disability better than anyone else. And you know your process better than anybody else. So be open and transparent about your process and the goals of your process so that you can collaborate and find some solutions. Um, just simply saying, well, tell me what works. I'm like, okay, that's a start, but also try and tell them what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to say, um, I need to get through a docket and you are just one of X number of people I need to see this week, that's important for them to be able to understand um, but they might come up with something more creative for you than simply, I, I need an entire morning of your time when typically you give me five minutes. Maybe it's, I need five minutes in the morning and 10 minutes in the afternoon and spreading it out is what's going to help. And giving you 15 minutes when I'd normally give you five is way easier than giving you four hours when I'd normally give you five. Um, so be open about your goals and your processes so that you can come together and then make Make the process for asking conspicuous. Um, don't expect that every person with a disability identifies as being a person with a disability. Um, as we talked about the various types of disabilities someone might have, um, not all of those people walk around the world socially identifying as disabled. If you have cancer or HIV or diabetes or obesity, do you, when someone says you need a disability accommodation, uh, do they immediately think, oh yeah, 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 I need that. It's like, no, but I am really beat up by chemo on these days. So I can't possibly be like, okay, well, that's totally a coverable disability thing. But how would someone know that and know to use that disability process? So you got to be conspicuous and look for accommodation resources. I'm going to provide some of those. So hopefully you're all familiar with GR33. I think I would offer be really conspicuous about GR33 with folks because you never know who has a disability and who doesn't. I asked around my office before doing this presentation, hey, what are some of the biggest things, you know, that people need in court? And they're like, honestly, just knowing GR33 is a thing or that GR33 is followed with the procedural protections in there. Um, but I will highlight A, B, and C here that you're making reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures. That means doing things different. That's inefficient but that's what that means. Or furnishing, at no charge, auxiliary aids and services. That means it's gonna cost more. And yeah, and you all are pretty used to that, right? Like um, uh, the private sector sometimes has a uh, harder time understanding some of those things. And then here's one that I always like to point out, over the years, people have become, they've, they've heard it and seen it and become more accustomed with it. Um, but it can also include representation by counsel when appropriate. Um, where would that be appropriate? Maybe someone with an intellectual disability who's representing themselves pro se. Are they going to be able to understand how to ask for a continuance or how to uh, object to uh, the evidence that someone else is presenting? Um, and maybe they are, maybe they aren't, and maybe a lawyer is what gets in there and maybe it's something else. So um, you've got some great resources yourself. Um, uh, that I will click on a link here and it will. All right. Can you all see that? If someone can give me a thumbs up that you can see this uh, web page. Um, it is I'm not seeing a thumbs up from anyone, but then again. Okay, I see David uh, Whidbey. So, uh, great. So here, you've got on your court website, request an accommodation. Now, how many people are trolling your website looking for this type of stuff? So make it conspicuous, let litigants know, let jurors, you know, potential jurors know this is here and they can request it. It's pretty simple, straightforward to request, but someone might need help doing that. Then if we go to the next slide, you've also collected... And I found this um, not because I went to your court website, because I just Googled and I found it that way. So it might be good to have up on your, um, uh, oops, sorry, here we go, up on your page somewhere, if it isn't already and I just missed it, is here's a list that you all put together around different resources. And in this is a, uh, I will go to the next slide, in that, um, 
list is this document, ensuring equal access to people with disabilities. It's a big old document. Like here, some of the things I'm citing are page 57. So it's big, it's long. It goes through lots of disabilities. It was created though in 2006 and updated modestly in 2011. My office was involved in that. Um, not me directly. I mean, behind the scenes, I'd offer you know a little tip in here or there. But lots of good work by lots of great people um, went into this document, and um, it. Sorry, it keeps bouncing down. There we are. Um, it has. If we jump down to, I think forty-five. There's even a little chart here. Now, they're up above, there's more text that describes some of the things, but just some examples. If someone has a urinary tract infection. In Washington, that's a, that is a disability under the Washington Law Against Discrimination. It's medically cognizable, diagnosable, and it's gonna impact you in sitting in court. Uh, and they may need frequent restroom breaks. You can make that happen. And that, it may be annoying, but it, uh, it can be done. Uh, and it would certainly allow someone more direct impact. We get to some things like a back injury, provide a reclining chair, consider telephone or video conference hearings when appropriate. And that was back before COVID days when that seemed like a big lift. Now that should be relatively simple. Uh, providing a sign language interpreter for someone who's deaf. Uh, you may even want to provide an ASL uh, communication aid in addition to the sign language interpreting for some of the other context clues that are not uh, verbally conveyed. Um, so there are many things you could do there. I wanted to provide, um, before I stop here, uh, I just have this in one more slide uh, to, to go through, that those are some court resources. They're a little old, but they're still very valuable. Um, and there are links, like I said, in that, that list. But people with disabilities use other services. They also go to work. Uh, they may have accommodations there. Uh, they may not, though, identify them as accommodations. Like, I have dyslexia, and um, my accommodation is I have a really good assistant who double checks a lot of things for me, you know, uh, who can read my handwriting that no one else, including my wife, can read my handwriting. Uh, so there, I don't think of that as an accommodation until I think about, oh, man, if I took another job, how am I going to uh, figure that out? Or... Uh, so think about that. They may not identify, but they realize, oh, this is how I do it here. Um, it may be that um, those settings are more nimble and they go, you know, a large employer might have many, many, many employees with disabilities and have thought through this in their HR department many times. So you get to leverage any benefit those individuals have thought through. And uh, then those environments, though, may be different. They might be less stressful than your environment. And as such, they aren't perfect analogs, but they might be somewhat useful. And then finally, if you go to the job accommodation network, you, you get a page that has a list of all sorts of disabilities. And I'm going to click on that. And um, show you, you go down here and here are all these disabilities. You can click on any of them. We click on, let's do mental health because I was hitting that earlier. Um, Let's see, there we are. And it takes you to a page on mental health conditions. And what are some ways, what are some questions to consider? So asking about some different aspects. So you start to get a feel for what are the range of accommodations we might need to do. Here's some key accommodation ideas. And you click on any one of these, it'll take you to another page that describes why would a rest area or private space be useful? An individual may need space to take medication or perform hygiene associated with activities of daily living. An area reserved for a rest area or private space could be a reasonable accommodation. So you think, oh, yeah, that that might be like maybe someone just needs like a low sensory place. And so, especially like Superior Court is very different than federal court where I normally practice. There's lots of quiet places to just find a spot to to calm down, to talk to your lawyer, to to think about something. Um, that can be harder to find at the downtown Seattle courthouse. So thinking through that as things that we've designed the courthouse to be a bit more chaotic and fast paced than the federal courthouse. That is not, that's not a fault of the individual, but that individual may need some help in bridging between um, what, what they could get somewhere else in access to justice what they can get in your environment. So with that, I'll just uh, leave you that the job accommodation network could be a really, we just went through those links.
could be a really good resource in addition to the resources you already have on your page. <clears throat> but as a resource, not something you need to commit to memory, but know is there when you start brainstorming and having an interactive process. So with that, I missed my mark of 10 minutes, but I did leave five, which we we're going to, is it going to be five or 10? So um, let's see. Uh, I've got some questions here. I'm, I'm going to stop for a second because reading is difficult for me. So I'm going to just read them and then, so I'm going to stop talking. That should probably be fine. Okay, so there's a question about universal accommodations and the value to courts and um, versus more individualized accommodations. Of course, universal design is going to be great because it's going to knock out most of your accommodation requests uh, pretty easily um, if it gives equal access. A good example given in the question and that we've seen since the pandemic has started is Zoom. People can get to court much easier and than um, in the past and can control the environment they're in while they're in court. Um, it may be a headache for you to put together and operate. Uh, maybe it's less so now if you've had years of experience, but um, that's very different than uh, uh, providing some private location for someone to decompress in between, you know, during a recess. Um, but if you want the next session to be productive, you might need to provide that decompression space. So, or you could have it at home. The question with remote court is always, is it actually equal? Um, when everybody is at that, uh, stage, it, it is, but when some aren't and some are. So thinking through that and some of how do we mitigate that, um, is important. Um, but universal design, much like universally designing the building to be physically accessible so that someone with a uh, physical access need doesn't need to come in through a loading dock elevator and can just come in through the regular security checkpoint and go on up and navigate the building however they choose to. Um, then uh, here's another question I'm going to read for a second. So there was a, a comment that the interactive process can be um, difficult or uncomfortable. And uh, if you truly think of it as interactive and saying, I am curious about how I can make our services better, I think that will help in that situation, um, as opposed to uh, sending off a vibe, even if you're not doing it, of I'm trying to figure out the least I can do, or maybe I can do nothing if I can bounce you from saying you're not disabled enough. And so instead, like, okay, so what are we doing? And one rule of thumb I have for both my clients and, uh, who are facing like discrimination and when I'm doing in-house counsel for my own office and my, my director says, hey, what do you think here? And I'm like, you know, in any situation, I do not like being on the side of whoever drew the line in the sand first and said, I'm going no further than this. Someone's eventually going to have to do that, but I like to be the person who's always hanging in there, genuinely trying to figure out a solution and let someone else decide this is not working. Um, so if you're coming in with that openness and trying to figure out a solution and not saying, no, nope, can't do that, can't do that, I was like, okay, that's going to be really difficult. Can we do something kind of like this? I'm not saying no to that, but is it, we could meet more needs if we did it this way. Does that still work? Um, and taking no for an answer, like okay, that doesn't work. Okay, let's keep let's keep coming at this. Um, that would that's a much better way to approach um, the need for individual accommodations that you uh, can't address through universal design and need to be more individually tailored. Um, let's see. And then based on the survey of lawyers that determined that 18% of them encountered obstacles to court access, were there any reoccurring problems? Um, uh, I did not see in that study that it, it delved into that that much. Um, I I have had uh, an attorney as a client before, and uh, I I know that um, accommodations in the and uh, whether it's sign language interpreter or um, audio equipment in the courtroom or um, an assistant to help with this or that, and is uh, trying to figure out how the court process as a whole can work and what 
which is the responsibility of the employer or the firm and what is the responsibility of the court um, that may take sometimes it's sort of a hot potato and the lawyer is just like i'm stuck in the middle like i i need these things to do my job and both are saying it's someone else's responsibility or it's our responsibility sometimes and theirs just sometimes that that can be difficult so coordination in that interactive process while the interactive process is a concept in the employment arena um it is what gets you to the accommodation the, the individualized accommodation request when universal design is inefficient or ineffective um so let's see any other questions before we wrap oh we're at 115 right there so i think we answered all the questions that were already in the chat and um i appreciate the time and please um uh, Take a look out for those resources i can share my powerpoint if if accessing the resources through those links is easier for folks than googling but honestly googling ada accommodations uh king county gets king county court uh, gets you to that long list of uh uh resources you've already put together well david thank you so much for um that perhaps uh rare ability to get into these concepts with greater uh, concepts of ableism and sanism and things that we contend with, uh, like it or not, probably on a daily basis, um, in helping us explore those in their nuance, where I think the detail really matters. And thanks, too, for all of the practical suggestions that you provided there at the end. Um, I, I did wonder whether you might be willing to share your uh, PowerPoint and the attached resources to I, for one, um, found some of those statistics helpful, not to mention the resources that you uh, directed us to. So if you could, I don't, I don't know how you want to do that. Um, maybe just email me. And then if, if somebody wants to uh, get a hold of those, you can email me, David Wedby, and I will um, make sure to uh, forward it on to anybody who might be interested. Um, all right. Well, seeing that we don't have any more um, I, I'm getting one question about will the recorded presentation be available um, after today? Beth, do you know how we can make that available to folks who might want to revisit these things? Uh, I will send it out. We will put it on um, the court's YouTube and on a, the private channel, so link access. Okay. I'll send it to the AOC reps. All right, wonderful, perfect, thank you. All right, well, and I, and I also wanted to just thank all of the participants. I think we were over 70 people and um, from within the King County Superior Court community, but also beyond. Um, and so I welcome everybody who came from across the state in any capacity to uh, see David's great presentation. David, thanks again so much uh, for all of your work and, and passing on your knowledge to us. Um, and we will see you again soon. Thanks again, everybody.